Ladies and gentlemen, welcome along to another episode of EOTT, Everything on the Table with me, Jimmy James. And I've got yet another treat for you on the Sabbath. We have with us today, Jacob Hawley. How are you, Jacob? I'm good. How are you? Um, very well, thank you, brother. Very well indeed. Yeah, thanks for taking the time on the Sunday to come and have a chat with me. Right, uh, we've been kind of... Ah, oh, brilliant. Thank you, brother. We've uh, been conversing a little bit over the last few weeks. Um, I found Jacob through his podcast um, on drugs, but we won't get ahead of ourselves. We'll go back to 2017, Jacob. It seems that was a bit of a good year for you. You were a finalist in the BBC New Comedy Awards, and uh, according to the internet, as a result, you are now a critical voice in British comedy, and I'm sure your fans will agree. I've seen a bit of your stuff. You're a funny, <laughs> funny guy. So how did that all come about, Jacob? Tell us a little bit about that, if you would. Uh, well, I, I've, I started stand-up uh, it's five years ago now, it's 2014. Um, and, you know, I was just sort of working my way through the open mic circuit in London, doing bits and bobs here and there. And then, yeah, entered the BBC competition. Uh, I got very lucky with the BBC competition, actually. I wasn't even supposed to be in it. Uh, some, someone, um, someone basically called in sick. Um, so that, that's how I got a heat. And oh, then, yeah, I worked won through my heat and then I won uh, yeah I won the semi-final and then yeah going to go into the final that year up in up at the Edinburgh Fringe and uh, yeah things have just gone from there really nice I bet that was an experience for you um, tell, tell us Jacob who are your um, kind of inspirations in the comedy world um, I, I think comedy is one of those it's a bit like music where once you're in it you end up with these sort of like really niche tastes do you know what I mean so, so whenever yeah. anyone says to you who are you into what, what's your like you end up sounding like a bit of a dick because you, you know all these people that no one else has heard of. Do you know? No, what I mean? not at all. Go on, test us. See, see what we know. People, I mean, there's there's some great people like uh, like John Kearns for me is one of my absolute favourites. That's a new one on uh, me, brother. So you are right. He's a new one yeah. on me. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, do, I think in terms of like re- relevant to the podcast, J- Jamali Maddox. I don't know if you've heard of Jamali. I haven't. No. Um, no. Um, so he's got a series of sort of documentary shows that are coming out on Channel 4 at the moment. But previous okay. to that, he, he had a show on uh, Viceland called Hate Thy Neighbour. Oh, okay. Um, and it's sort of about racism uh, within within the UK and within America as well. Right. Um, and yeah, so J- Jamal, Jamali's one, I mean, you know, relevant to the podcast, he's someone who managed to combine like stand-up comedy with sort of documentary journalism in quite an interesting way. And I, that was something that was, uh, yeah, quite influential on me when I, when I tried to make the podcast. Oh, fair play. Yeah, it's good if you can do something like that because you can have kind of, not the comedy doesn't have real world impact because it really does. It makes people feel good and all that kind of stuff. But as you say, if you can kind of utilize it in with current issues and, and make sense about it, which leads me nicely on to my next question, which is you, um, was it as a result of the comedy awards then that you got into the BBC with the uh, Welcome to Britain, Radio 4? Yeah, well, I think so. I I mean, I I think that's definitely uh, sort of slicked the wheels a little bit. I think in terms of I've I've managed to do a bit of work with the BBC since then, and I think that's probably helped with all of it. Like, um, yeah, so I did my show uh, last year on Radio 4 called Welcome to Britain, um, which is kind of about social class and and the Brexit referendum and stuff. Um, And, yeah, you know, I've done a few sort of shorts and stuff with them since then, and then, yeah, onto the podcast as well. So, I, th- I think having that involvement as a result of the competition definitely opened a few doors. Awesome, awesome. And did they kind of approach you or did you kind of find something to apply for that got you in the door or how did it come for about? The, for the podcast? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I was aware that as a result of BBC Sounds popping up, they were going to be making podcasts. Um, and I, I knew I wanted to do some kind of documentary about drugs, whether that was a TV thing or a podcast or radio or whatever. So I'd had the idea for a few years um, ju- just because I've got life experience around it, yeah. you know? And I yeah. think it's also a topic that I don't think is covered in the media in a way that usually, that in a way that humanizes people the way I think it should. You know, I, I think I've yeah. watched so many Stacey Dooley documentaries and I'm sure she's a nice person, but I've watched these documentaries and it's like, they would they, they would put like a, a monster mask on drug dealers if they can, you know. Yeah. They 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 want to, you know, drug dealers are the villains, uh, drug addicts are losers, and everyone else is clean and, and well to do. And I, I wanted to make something that was a little bit more nuanced and try to understand why people get involved in this world. 
Yeah, fair play to you, respect for that, because it is, as you say, a very one-sided representation in the media, certainly in this country. Like, um, I've got the episode titles written down here, but how, during your journey and kind of discovery, obviously you've got the kind of uh, experience on the ground, personal life experience, as I'm sure I certainly do, and I'm sure a lot of other people will do. But for people who don't have any experience on the ground of actually being a part of it and experiencing it, uh, it does seem you only have kind of your media representations to kind of make any sort of uh, assessment or judgment on the situation. Were you kind of, as you went through the kind of episodes, you looked into like legislation, you talked to the police, you talked to dealers, you kind of went all over the shop. What was your kind of perception of how things are on the ground really? What, what, was, was there any, any specific things that kind of shocked you or was it all kind of what you expected it to be? Oh, there was definitely things that shocked me. I mean, it, the... I think I, I think I think you know it's it's such a broad spectrum all the way from yeah. people who I mean I, I you know genuine like hate <clears throat> mail that I've received just for covering the topic oh, right. do you yeah, know what I mean yeah. like like just, just yeah. for talking and the the one actually I think the the episode that kind of was the most I, I wouldn't say shocking but certainly revealing to me was the chemsex episode yeah I've got that written down I'll come on to that yeah go on uh, I, I knew nothing I, I, that was a world that I knew next to nothing about, uh, and the, the what, what I heard about it, what I learned about it, and everything was the most revelatory to me out of everything. You know, there, there, there were other things that surprised me. The fact that I, I spoke to um, uh, the mother and the sister of a guy called Max that I went to school with. He died from an MDMA overdose six years ago, and it, his his mum and his sister's openness to the idea of legalization and their openness to the idea of certain drugs being used within therapy that I thought that was, uh, not shocking, but certainly surprising and, and quite uplifting. The fact that they've got such an open mind to, to those things. Um, you know, to, to, talking to Sean Atwood, who I think is a, a mutual friend of ours. Yeah. She's a legend, Sean. It's hard not to be shocked by some of the stuff he talks about, especially out in Arizona. Oh, I've read his books, yeah. Really, mate, really bad. I, I've got them in front of me just now. He, he gave me yeah. a few copies when we did it. Yeah, man. Uh, crazy stuff. But but yeah, I, I think the reaction, that it got both positive and negative. I didn't expect, um, I, you know, ex, extreme in both ways. The, the people that love it have been so kind, so nice, and, you know, re, really outgoing in their praise for it. And the people who don't like it, it it's... it's uh, it, it it makes you realise drugs really frighten people. You know, mm, dr- dr- yeah. drugs really frighten people as a, as a blanket topic. People, uh, yeah, people are scared by them, and people do feel like they're they're responsible for a lot of evil things. I mean, we, so, so there was there was one thing in particular that was quite interesting. In it. So, as part of the campaign to promote it, uh, the BBC made these videos um, that they put on Instagram, and one of them, and I'm sure they wouldn't mind me saying this, but one of them was quite hastily edited, and this was on the subject of chemsex. Right. And people's reaction to that, and it's because of what the drug, it's because of the drugs that are used within chemsex, specifically with hypno. Yeah. Uh, and it, and the, it's it's you know G, which is a, a commonly used chemsex drug, is a form of a chemical that is similar to a hypno, so it's not like a hypno. Yeah, yeah. So it, yeah. Well, it, it, it's, it's actually GB, so it's actually a slightly okay. different compound. But right. pe- people have a misconception that it's the same as rohypnol. So as soon as you do a podcast talking about the use of this drug, people go, oh, you're, you're advocating the use of date rape drugs, which obviously isn't the case at all. And yeah. within, within the actual episode, you know, it, it's, it's fairly... The, the the sort of view, viewpoint that we're using is you have to be fucking careful if you're going to use this stuff and it's dangerous. Um, James, one of the people we spoke to in the episode, he's a really good author. He he's talked about how it's the biggest killer of gay people since HIV. You know, mm-hmm. chem, chems and chemsex and these drugs. So the, yeah, the reaction is pretty volatile, and that that's something I maybe wasn't prepared for. But um, but at the same time, there's been some really nice responses as well. So. Yeah, I think you kind of have to take the rough with the smooth. As is, as is the way with everything in life, Jacob. As you say, you know, you're not going to please all the people all the time. It's quite funny, actually. You mentioned the um, 
the date rape element because when I was chatting with Sean and I was telling him about my experience and um, it was just a little aside about having access to so many different drugs now with the introduction of the dark net and before that the different forms and I was just telling him about all the different benzodiazepines one of which is uh, called flunitrazepam I said a date rape drug I said it in the context of you know them guys used to use a lot of GHB yeah it's used as a date rape drug so certainly that's not what I was using it for and he said oh we stressed to add just for the audience that you weren't date rape I was like yeah obviously that goes without saying but you just say people have their own perceptions on certain things and as you say it, when you've got um kind of consenting adults doing their thing what, what people want to do in the in the privacy of their own kind of abodes is their business but it's some yes. some wild stuff going on out here Jake. Was some, there, uh, there is some wild stuff going on but, but i think that you know and, and what, right, one of the points you're alluding to there is the fact that different substances can be used for different things Yes, indeed. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, like, mm. see, so, so was it was it a benzo that you were talking about that can yeah, be used? blue nitrazepam? So it's essentially if you're on a if you're on a crazy cocaine bender, sometimes you get to that point where you just want to stop, you want to come down. But if, even if you stop sniffing, you know you've got hours and hours before your brain starts unwinding. <laughs> Whereas you can, yeah, you, well, you can take a flu nitrazepam and it'll just knock you clean out. You know, but that's right in, in the same way that a Valium, might, in indeed. the same way that a Diazepam yes. might. So, yeah. and, and like you say, if this is a compound that could be used as a date rape drug in the same way that G, what I was talking about, right? Now, yeah. vodka can be used as a date rape drug. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, of course. Vodka could be used as a date rape drug. Sleeping pills could be used as a date rape. I think the problem is people demonize all these, all these substances because of the way someone has used them once. You yeah. Know? yeah. Ketamine could be used as a... You know, if if someone wanted me to be, you know, really intoxicated, they, you know, and they wanted to do whatever with me, yeah. they could go, oh, mate, do this big line of coke. Yeah. It's ketamine. I pass out. I'm vulnerable. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Where, but, yeah. and, and so I think there's so many different drugs that you could talk about which could be used in a horrible way. Like crystal meth is one of the, the most, like, commonly used chemsex mm. drugs. But people don't. Yeah. I, I, th- I think... Part of the problem with the mentality towards drugs and substances that we have in the UK and in, in the West is is that we demonise a substance, and it's not the substance that's the problem; it's the way it's used and the way that it's misused. You know, yeah, the, 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 a substance can't be evil. Like <laughs> a, substance is neutral, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. The, the bleach in my bathroom is neutral. You know, you could do something horrendous with that. You, you hear about acid attacks in London. Yeah, that that stuff is not made to be thrown in people's faces. It, it's what people do with things, and I, I think, yeah, that, that's that, that's again, that's something that sort of frustrated me. Whenever conversations around drugs happen, is that people attach emotion to an inanimate object or a substance, and it's like, yes, you could yeah. misuse it in a certain way, but that's not to say there's that's a problem, you know. Yes, no, you're exactly right there. It was kind of refreshing to, and sorry to hear about your friend who passed away from the MGMA. Uh, can I just ask, uh, are you aware of how much he actually took? No, and I'm not even sure that the police are, to be honest with you. Yeah, because this is... Called so late. Um, and they, they, they were, you know, again, with MGMA, and, and I know people who use MGMA as a form of therapy, yeah. If yeah. the context, you know, which is really interesting, but it, yeah. in the context that Matt took it, he was in a squat rave, ironically, in a former police office in London, yes. uh, in, in an office block that used to be used by the police. The yeah. windows had been locked shut, so there was no ventilation, there was no running water, there was no one medically trained on the premises. Right. Yeah. He overheated. There, you know, he wasn't treated properly. That's how it goes on, right? So yes. <laughs> they. It, is the problem there MDMA or is the problem there the people running that event who had no running water, no mm. first aid trained staff and who would not let anyone into the building to help him? Yes. No, this is it. Like I do, I know, you know, I send my, my love and my love and thoughts to the family, you know, it's a terrible thing. Yeah. And, but I would say it's refreshing the fact that they are still open to, because I do get annoyed sometimes when things are misrepresented, like just, they've just gone, oh, MGMA overdose. Well, MGMA is one of the safest substances, apparently, according to Professor David Nutt and all the rest of it. Mm. Nevertheless, I don't encourage MGMA use. It's not, it's not a good thing. And for people like my mother, for example, she has a certain, bless her soul, she has a certain 
um, opinion and thoughts and feelings about drugs because of my life experience where I've had problems and issues and she's suffered the brunt of it, you know, but I think we're just so far behind. I've been watching this. You said about, you know, your illegal rave there and I went to a few free parties this year out in the, out in the wilds and say what you want about the illegal rave scene. They're good people and they look after each other. No one's left yeah. behind. If anyone's having any issues, you know, it's a really close knit kind of community. And we're starting to see a little bit more now of what we see in Holland with regards to like your drug testing facilities at venues. Mm-hmm. Um, have you seen the Drugs Lab, the Dutch um, show? No, I haven't seen that. It's really, really good. It's um, a group of youngsters, and essentially what they're doing is they because at the end of the day, drugs are there. You're not gonna, you know, prohibition doesn't solve anything. They're always going to be available. So it's about safety. Like we don't, we don't, we don't encourage it, and we don't promote it by any stretch, especially for younger people. But the fact of the matter is, I did it when I was younger, and I know there'll be young people now who will do the same thing. So it's about safety for those guys, testing yeah. kit, and access to information. So I just, I watched a little clip earlier of the drugs lab, and they tested um, MXE methoxetamine. Have you, are you familiar with? I've heard of it. Yeah, I have heard of it. Yeah, they call it Rhinocat. It's some, yeah. it was, and it was legal for a little while. That was the shocking part of it. Before they kind of blanket banned all the psychoactive substances, you could just buy MXE from a head shop, and MXE is some serious, seriously powerful kind of molecule. So, yeah, this drugs lab is just really refreshing to see that you know. You, have to, you just have to address it. It's there. You know, you can't hide it. And by not providing that information or safety information, this is how people have issues and this is how people have problems. What did you, what did you think of the current kind of um, situation, the climate on the ground in the UK compared to places like Norway, for example? I was watching the Vice documentary about Norway where they're looking to follow the Port- Portuguese kind of model of fully decriminalizing. We're very, mu- we're very much behind the curve in the UK, aren't we? I think so. I think, I think we're behind the curve. I, th- I think, um, and P- Portugal does seem to be the model that a lot of people cite in terms of a more progressive way of. I, I, I think what you say is really important, which is that people will always seek out narcotics. And, you know, there, there's science to prove that. David Nutt, who you mentioned earlier, he did a really interesting experiment where um, I, can't, I can't remember what animal it was. I think it might have been rats, but, you know, it, the. If if you offer animals uh, food that has narcotics in it and food that doesn't, they will go for the one with narcotics. Specifically, animals in a situation where they're lacking stimulation, you know. Mm, yeah. And it, you know there, there there are so many people in the UK who are in underprivileged situations where narcotics are maybe not necessary, but certainly desirable and when, when when you're in a shit place you, you you're more likely to seek out whether it's yeah. booze drugs whatever um in terms of legislation within the uk it do you know it was it was it was strange because around the time that we started releasing the podcast there suddenly seemed to be more conversation about legalization um there's a think tank in the uk and let me try and remember what they're called that we spoke to uh think tank um it was lizzie the girl that we spoke to let me just quickly find it here yeah lizzie no mcculloch um but basically she, i can't remember what i think tank's called but they they, they did a uh I'll they did yeah, I'll put a link in the description box here yeah lizzie mcculloch is who we spoke to on the podcast but they, they 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 did a poll last year um about uh whether people would be open to the idea of legalizing certain forms of cannabis I think last year, in you know, in the summer of 2018, the numbers were around 30 or 40 percent in favour, and that right. swung to uh, about 68 percent now, um, and that's largely down to the Billy Coldwell case, which was yeah. summer 2018. The, the young kid whose mum was stopped on her way back into the UK because she was trying to get uh, medicinal cannabis for her son. Now that, that's obviously even just legalising medicinal cannabis. That's a long way from uh, the Portugal model mm. of of drug legislation, but I do I do think at least from the public there's a sway towards a more open minded approach to drug legalization. I think you know, and and I remember that another thing that happened was down in Lambeth they opened a um, hospital specifically for treating people with cannabis psychosis. And the, you know the, the the reaction to that from the public was interesting because there were some people saying what. Well, 
it, you know, by having that there, you're almost encouraging people to. This is what they all say. Yeah. It's what they all say. It's what they all say. You know, if if you make provisions to look after people when they're in that state, people are more likely to get in the state. But the problem is, people are in the state anyway, right? Yeah, pe- yeah. People are suffering from whether it's psychosis or other problems that they are suffering from that anyway. I think it's going to be a long time before we really see a change in the UK towards legislation. I think, especially if you look at uh, who's in power right now and yeah. the, the kind of people who are making decisions about legislation in the UK right now, that they're, they're not the kind of people you would imagine would be open to the idea of of changing that legislation. And if they are, they, they're going to be going the other way with it. You know, believe you me that things are not going to be getting more open-minded or progressive under the current government, I don't believe. I think it's going to be going the other way. Well, you raise a good point there, Jacob, because um, we we can already see this. Are you familiar with the GW pharmaceutical story? Yeah. 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 So just a quick rehash then for any of the listeners who are not familiar with the situation. We're, we're in the UK, the United Kingdom, the island of Great Britain, currently finding ourselves in a situation where despite supposedly being the most progressive in a lot of different kind of arenas and fields and elements, it seems that we are so far behind the curve with regards to legislation regarding drugs. You know, you've got Canada, different states in America. And then on top of that, just to add a little bit of insult to injury, we've got our our ex-prime minister, kind of um, Theresa May and her husband, and Victoria Atkins, the drug minister, and her husband, all in cahoots, giving licenses to produce cannabis we are the biggest exporters on the planet. <laughs> yeah. what? So there's no medicinal value. There's certainly no recreational value. But yet the government are able to produce en masse and make fortunes from it. Where are yeah, we well, they, they, they can make fortunes from it. They the taxpayer, can, the yeah, taxpayer this doesn't the, see any of that. This is it. And then we'll get locked up as well. You know, people will get locked up for growing their own medicine. And essentially, you know, that is what it is for a lot of people. Of course, it's a recreational substance, but it has so many different medicinal values. The way I see it, Jacob, is that they are getting their ducks in order, you know, putting together these financial institutions, venture capital firms, registering companies on the stock exchange and all this, ready for it. So they can get all their kind of, as I said, ducks in order. And then when the change does come, it'll be for the benefit of a few and not for the rest of us, do you know? Well, that, that, you see, I, I spoke to a geezer in America called Kevin Sabat, um, and he's he's based in America. He's advised quite a few White Houses. I think it's four White Houses now. But he's very critical of the idea of legalizing cannabis specifically. Right. And that's one of the big reasons for doing so. He, he, he says if you look at the way that cannabis has been legalized in America at the moment, the profits are being taken by alcohol and cigarette companies. So alcohol and tobacco companies um, – are the ones profiting from the drugs market in America. It is, it is not the kids on the street, mm-hmm. you know, the, the people in poverty who are potentially making money from drugs now are, you know, it, that money is being taken away from them and it's being put back into the hands of big business. So while, whilst I'm not saying that it's a good thing that people in poverty have to sell drugs, that's not what I'm saying at all. Of course. That, 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 you know, the drug economy is just going to be dragged further and further away from, and, and like you say, we're, we're, we're seeing people get their ducks in order already. We've seen people prepare for that already to follow that American model should that be put in place so yeah. that it is still corporations making money from, for, from narcotics in the, in the same way that they do with tobacco and alcohol. And the, the, the worry that you have there is that if you look at the way that alcohol is marketed, it's marketed in a way that targets the vulnerable. If you look at the way that cigarettes are marketed, they're market. You know, we're only now really getting a hold on the way that people people consume and buy cigarettes. And you know, I'm not saying we should ban them, but it, you know, we're only now seeing an economy around tobacco that is actually careful of the of, of the repercussions of, of smoking tobacco, and. If you look at the way that the cannabis economy is, it works in America, and as you say, how it looks like it could happen here, well, whilst I'm someone who, who can see the benefits to legalizing cannabis, I think, I think the way that that economy would work would still target vulnerable people. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying, because essentially, like what you were saying earlier, people seem to think, oh, if you legalize something, then more people are going to use it because it's acceptable and they're allowed to use it. But I have seen kind of different research and studies say that's not really the case. That's not 
what you see on the ground level. Oh, because heroin is illegal, we're all going to go out and just start taking heroin. That's not that's not how these things. No, work. It's not, no, it's not. But yeah. I, I, th- I think as with anything, as as with any product that has potential negative effects, potential addictive effects, potential you know psychosis, something with cannabis as well. It has to be marketed in a way that's responsible, and it has to be sold and produced in a way that's responsible. The same with alcohol, you know. Yeah. And and if if we are going to enter into a legislation that allows for the the legal sale of cannabis, it, it needs to be done so in a responsible way. In the same way that alcohol shits, you know. I agree. I agree. With it's kind of parallels with you. Know, I can't remember how long ago it was, but the alcohol pops. You know, the alcohol pops. Yeah. And everyone's seen, got a wicked side all that there stuff. we go there we go and now you've got you know right you've got cannabis bud but cannabis bud is old news now it's all about the vapes it's all about the lollies it's about the sweets the chewy CBD the, oil, all that. the oils the, the the hash brownies the milkshakes you know it's been fully commoditized and as you say much easier than to um target younger people uh, because it's all profit to this essentially at the end of the day when when certain interests are in charge of these things profits are their primary kind of goal and just yeah. to quickly um add on you're saying the dangers of psychosis i've actually been sectioned myself um from psychosis which in in, in at least um some part was uh attributable to the fact that i was vaporizing and vaporizing, right. what i thought was natural THC and was in fact synthetic THC. Really? Indeed, yeah. And I'd smoked it. Yeah. As I mentioned to you, we've we've had a few previous discussions about possibly um podcasts and whatnot. And I told you my story, the seven years I've served for drug offenses, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, primarily MDMA and stuff. And while I was in jail I tried the synthetic cannabis. And uh it's not very nice. It's quite unpleasant. But this stuff, the 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 the, the oil that they were making, they'd got the balance just right. So it was actually quite nice. It was like cannabis, but I got so addicted. Mm. To it, I was working from home and just vaping all day, every day. And I think it must have built up to a critical mass in my system. And as you said, messed up the brain patterns there. And that was a very unpleasant uh, experience. So it is very, very important that people, you know, take all these things into consideration because to just, boom, there we go. Anyone can have whatever they want. We are probably going to, you know, end up with problems. So we do have to kind of, I think we can learn from all the different models all over the shop, you know, we've got all the different yeah. stuff going on and kind of take the best of all of it. But as you say, that it's not even up for conversation at the moment, it seems, with the current government. I think, you know, no, we can get into the, yeah, we can get into the whole, like, do we actually need government and all that? That's a different, a different issue. There, there's many different perspectives on this. And I know you've had to chat briefly with um, Daryl Bickler, who I chatted to, and he's got a really good, oh, yeah. Yeah, he's got a really good perspective. He's a hell of a fellow on what he wants to do. He's a bit full, full, Daryl. He's a good egg. He's a good soul, but he's kind of a little bit of a bull in a china shop. So I'm kind of, we're kind of collaborating a little bit and trying to kind of, because it is important information, but it needs to be presented in the right way for people to grasp it because it's such a, well, it's all confusion, isn't it? It's all this legalese and political language and legislation language. It's all confusion on the, on the very surface of it. And then when you kind of get into the nitty gritty of it, and if you were to go and check Daryl's episode out, legal drugs do not exist, you'll see what I mean. It's very interesting stuff. And it's only by collaborating, coming together, getting on say, the podcast, is E-O-T-T, everything on the table, by getting all the perspectives out there together, we can all come together and find a solution. That's what I feel for all of the problems that we're currently under. under yeah, absolutely, man. And, and in terms of Daryl, you know, Th- theoretically, I, th- I I I probably do agree with him in the, in the sense that you know he, I I, th- I think I think in in essence his theory is is around the idea that you can't really make a substance illegal, right? Yeah, yeah. And and you know as I was saying to you earlier when when we were talking about uh you know how the, the benzos that you were talking about how they can be used in, in a in a nasty way that the drugs that I was talking about in relation to chemsex how they can be like I, I do agree. That a a substance cannot be evil, you know. Yeah. But I I, th- I think I think where I I, I think where, where I spoke to Daryl before and we maybe clashed a little bit was that, and I whilst I understand his theory, I feel like the the way that society operates and legislation operates at the moment is a million miles from that. It really you know? is. It really is. Yeah, you are and, right there. And, this and is where we need to come right, together for right or wrong. And. You know, I, as I say, I, I'd be open to the idea of giving his way a go, 
but the reality right now is that that isn't how things are and and there are people suffering because that that isn't the way things are right now so if, if i were to speak to someone like yourself and say uh oh look mate that you know substances it's literally impossible for a substance to be illegal you could turn around to me and go well what the fuck was i doing in jail for seven years yeah do, do you know what i mean and then yeah. for, for so many people that there's there's a lived experience that was a consequence of these things being illegal so what whilst in theory yes substances cannot be bad cannot be illegal in practice there are people going to jail every single day whether it be for possessing something whether it be for selling something and for those people those substances very much are illegal because because that they've got a lived experience based on the fact that that is how legislation currently works and and in yeah. theory you know i i completely agree with what you're saying but i just think right now there are too many people with a lived experience based on the legality of these substances that it's kind of churlish to to dismiss that yeah no, thank you, uh, Jacob. I appreciate that because, as you say, from the current situation we're at, everything that Daryl spoke to me about, I could grasp it all, um, the majority of it made complete sense to me what he was discussing. But as you say, it's, it's like going from uh, A to Z without any of the in-between, you know? Obviously, that's his, it's his lived life experience with um, the wizard who he kind of got in touch with and all, all that kind of story transpired. And it's taken him quite a long time to, you know, get it all to grips within his own head. But he knows he's right. And I agree with what you're saying is exactly right. But it's such a contrast to where we are right now. There needs to be um, a kind of growth. And, you know, it's, it's hard to adopt something that's quite alien. Do you know what I mean? And even though he knows he understands it's completely right, it's you're not going to, because some people are so dialed into the current paradigm, just like, we need to change the laws, but when you actually understand how those kind of legal statutes and stuff are set up, it's like for me, for example, they say, well, what did you go to jail for? And I say, selling drugs. And they're like, no, you didn't. You went to jail for supplying controlled substances without a license. Well, well yeah, technically, this is true. Yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, it is technically true. And then you think about, yeah, actually, it's like people now being... Um, and people get annoyed at me for talking in this kind of terminology, people like my friend David Robinson, you know, because they're so far down their own rabbit holes. And, and, and it's legitimate stuff with regards to kind of common law and all this kind of stuff. But not, you know, I call it the spectrum of awakening. We're all awake to different things. And it does seem to be that we all need to come to a kind of common ground. And like I said, it's only by sharing all this information that, you know, that's what we're going to be able to do. And nothing's going to happen overnight, especially when we've got such massive money interests involved. But yeah. things can. Things can. And as you said, as long as everyone's happy to come to the table and have a talk about these things, then we will be able to make positive progress, I think. Yeah, definitely, mate. Definitely. I think, I think this, this is the way forward by, by, by sharing those opinions and those, uh, and, and, and those perceptions of how things are and how they should be in, in a way that's constructive and balanced, you know? Yes, yes, indeed. And we've, we've got all the te technology at, at our fingertips, you know. You know, Sean encouraged me to do my own podcast. And I thought, yeah, and it's just Zoom conversations. That's what makes it so easy because, like you said, it's Sunday afternoon, you're just chilling at home, I'm chilling at home, but we, we can just link up, have a conversation, put it out there, and other people can come to it. And I'm sure it'll spur on and we'll have an ongoing narrative, you know, and that's what we need to be doing at the moment, I think. That's what I feel I need to be doing anyway. And I, I appreciate you coming along and having your bit of input to it. So, yeah, man. Well, look, thanks for getting me involved. I really appreciate it. No, thank you. I do really appreciate it. So if anyone wants to check out Jacob's stuff, uh, I'll put all the links in the description box. And what have you got coming up for yourself, Jacob? Uh, so I, I, can't, I can't say anything too officially, but we, we are going to be making yeah. more uh, drugs podcasts in the future. Oh, fantastic. Excellent. Some more coming out on BBC Sounds. Um, and yeah, I've got, I've got some live shows coming up as well, uh, which, you know, all on my Twitter and my website and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, pretty, pretty busy. But um, yeah, I'm excited to so we'll be doing some more drugs podcasts in the future. Ah, fantastic. Well, when we come off there, you can send me the link and I'll put all that in the description description box so people can check out your work brother Top man. Top man. Well, thanks yeah, for getting me involved Jim man I appreciate it thank you brother thank you indeed have yourself a wonderful afternoon yeah take care yeah bye all the best buddy